So Goldman Sachs just called for the next decade to be what's called a lost decade in equities. What does that even mean? Well, basically what they're saying is that in 10 years, the average return in the S&P 500 is barely, if at all, going to outpace the rate of inflation, meaning it's going to be really hard to increase purchasing power of your money through investing. Now, obviously, just coming through the greatest bull run that we've ever seen, where people had nearly 200% returns in the S&P 500 over the past you know, 15, 10 to 15 years, it is a polar opposite scenario. So what I wanna do in this video is go through why are they calling for the lost decade, kind of go through a little bit of their projections and, and talk about what is leading them to this conclusion and ultimately talk about the history. Have there ever been times like this before? And thirdly, what is the impact on index universal life insurance and whole life insurance as foundational assets in our life based on this projection, i.e. if we have a lost decade, how does it impact each product? If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell, that way you're notified every time I launch a new video. I've got videos like this coming out all the time. Let's go. Hey, what's going on, Cashflow Hackers? It's Chris, Life 180. This video, we are talking about Goldman Sachs' prediction for the lost decade, and without further ado, uh, let's just get into it and start talking about this and get into the impact on uh, equities, on IUL, on whole life insurance, on all these things. So the first thing I want to cover here is what is the basis of the Goldman Sachs prediction? Well, you know, what is the context? What are, what are they saying? Why are they saying that these things are going to happen? So I think what they're, what they're really leading on, there are several metrics that they're looking at that are impacting their, their conclusion uh, and their hypothesis that, that there's going to be an average growth of 3% per year in equities over, over the next decade. First and foremost is high market concentration. What does that even mean? Well, high market concentration means that there's too much of the valuation is concentrated on too few companies, meaning the success of the market is being driven by companies like Tesla and Apple and Nvidia and like companies of this nature that are having too much of the success. And so that when, when so much of the, the index success is driven by very few companies, that actually puts a lot of risk that if those companies take a pullback, it'll have a, an overweighted kind of an asymmetric risk into the, into the overall investment economy. Some of the other things that they're concerned about, and I'm gonna get into this as I go here, uh, but they're elevated valuations, right? The company valuations right now, the PE ratios of companies are at the highest levels that we've seen in a long time. And historically speaking, that tends to lead to bigger pullbacks going forward in the future because those valuations have to even out. They're worried about economic slowdowns. Obviously, we just came through the greatest bull run of all time. We're still kind of in it. I can't say we've come through it because we're still in it, even though it sometimes doesn't feel like we are. Um, but when we're talking about um, being on the back end of bull runs at any point in time, it's inevitable eventually for a slowdown to happen. And then of course, when all that happens, uh, you know, you tend to get rising bond yields um, in that environment on the back end of these situations. And especially with inflation the way it's been, with interest rates going up, as, as we have rising bond yields, that tends to put downward pressure on equities because people can get higher returns with less risk and uh, why go uh, chase risk in the market, right? That's one of the things that's been happening a lot in equities is that because there's no money to be earned in the fixed market, people are taking risk and kind of chasing and forcing returns by putting money into the markets when they realize that they don't have to do, uh, they don't have to take all that risk to get these basic returns that they're going after, people will tend to pull their money out. That puts downward pressure on the market. So my overall hypothesis here is that if we have a situation where we have a lost decade, what happens is that's gonna put really strong downward pressure on index universal life policies because A, it's, we're, we're not gonna be able to take advantage of upside potential in the policies because if the market is only averaging 3% over the next decade, well, that's gonna be what it is. And my overall hypothesis that I'm gonna share with you is that the reality, my, my perspective and my reality here is that the IUL has market in general has been bailed out by the greatest bull run of all time. A lot of these policies have been sold on upside potential and downside uh, protection, but the policies have not performed the way that they were sold. 
And I think that the next decade, especially if Goldman Sachs is right, is going to accelerate and expose Index Universal Life uh, as kind of a fraud in this space and, 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 and expose it as not being able to do for you as a policyholder what it was promised to you to do. So one of the reasons that Goldman Sachs used for the, its hypothesis of this last decade is uh, high valuations of companies. And, and historically speaking, there is context for this. If we go back in history and we look at you know, lost decades as they've happened, they've always been preceded by these overly inflated company valuations. We can go back to 1929 in the crash, uh, you know, the Great Depression. What happened there is it was preceded by a high P.E. ratio, price to earnings ratio of companies that were over 32. Now, historically, P.E. ratios of companies are about 15. So anytime they get above 15, you, you can tell there's kind of a, a situation where they, they become overvalued and there's different reasons that that happens, but ultimately it puts it at risk for a, pull, a pullback. Now, in the 1970s, we obviously had uh, monetary decisions that happened in the 60s that led to the stagflation era in the 1970s. In the 70s, the P.E. ratios were not as bad. Uh, they were in the 20 to 22 range, but the bottom line is because of the monetary policy, because inflation was so bad, because there was other economic challenges in the economy like oil shortages, gas prices, all these things, it led to another lost decade. Once again, there are great returns, but when we look at purchasing power and inflation compared to those returns, that's where the lost decade comes in. Now, the next one was the dot-com bubble in 2000s. And you could actually look at uh, the 2000 through 2009 was the first decade that were actually negative returns in the market over that long of a period of time. That's not that long ago. And, and when you look at how these uh, things have a potential of repeating on us, the risks are real. Of course, 2008, the Great Recession happened. That was more driven by real estate. You know, but from that point till today, we've had this kind of unprecedented environment of quantitative easing, money printing, bailout programs. Of course, the pandemic happened that injected a lot of money into the, into the economy that forced inflation up. We're now in a situation where growth has been so big, so fast, and the, the indicators that, that show why the productive value that would lead to that kind of growth hasn't been there to back it up. And so one of the problems is when, when we have that kind of growth, well then, and, and there's no actual productive value on the back end to back it up, well, that's one of the problems. One of the things I was watching the other day is, you know, out of, out of the GDP of, of the United States economy, 80% of the GDP is consumption, only 20% is production. That is not a sustainable model from any perspective. So if you watch my channel at all, you know that my overall hypothesis has been for a long time that Index Universal Life over the next day, decade is gonna be completely exposed. That's one of the reasons I'm writing my new book that's gonna be coming out around Christmas time, IUL exposed the truth about the most misrepresented product in financial history. And I'll say this, is that I believe it's gonna be exposed and I think this, this um, hypothesis by and prediction by Goldman Sachs just kind of puts a rubber stamp on it. But the reality is there's been a lot of discrepancies in IUL performance despite market growth and the greatest bull run that we've ever seen over the past 10 to 15 years. If you think about it, IULs are sold as this context in the context of you know, upside potential, downside protection. But despite us being in the greatest bull market in history over the last decade, IULs have consistently underperformed their illustrated rates. The reason for this is that cap rates, options budgets, options costs have limited the potential growth of IULs. The crazy part is IUL is sold as participating in the index and giving upside potential, providing downside protection and all these things. But the reality is something quite different. And I wanna show this right now. The reality is the, the IUL performance has nothing to do with actual index performance. And, and this is why. If you look, you could see you participate in the S&P 500 uh, with an index universal life. And, and what they do is they, they focus on these numbers. I'm gonna do that line right here. They'll say that the 30-year historical average of the S&P 500 
when you know, and this is in 2018. So it, 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 that's when this was sold. This was actually July 11th, 2018, when this policy was sold. And so it was showing a 7.43% 30 year historical average. So the way that this would be sold would be saying, well, you can illustrate it conservatively at 6.54%. And this agent who did it actually illustrated it at only 6%, trying to position themselves as being even more conservative than what they would be allowed. And then when you look at the, the next years following 2018, the market only had two negative years, which in those years you would have a zero year, and then it had big years after that. But the problem is this, and you can see in 2024, we're at 16% right now. Here's the challenge. I'm gonna go and give you the updated version of this. When you look at the updated version of this, the 30 year historical average, and this is the what's called the in-force illustration. This is the same policy, just fast forwarded six and a half years to the current version. And the numbers have gone from 7.43 to 5.41%. That's all considering that between when this purchase, when this policy was purchased, in 2018, remember 7.43, between 2018 and 2024 right here, the policy, the S&P 500 averaged 11.76%. Yet somehow the 30 year historical average dropped. Why? Because of the fact that IULs, when you look at these numbers right here, when they sell off these 30 year historical average, it has nothing to do with, uh, with the actual S&P 500 performance. What happens is the cost of options and the options budget get impacted and that actually has the greatest indicator and impact on how the IULs function. And so then what happens is when this policy was sold, and I'm not getting into details, if you wanna go deeper, I will put a link to a video on the end screen that you can go watch that will explain exactly what I'm showing to you in much far greater detail than what I'm gonna do now. But the bottom line is this right here is based on a 7.6% cap rate, right? When it was sold in 2018, it had an 11% cap. So the reason IULs are struggling is because this, these companies are selling them with high cap rates and dropping the cap rates. Now, how is that relevant to the lost decade? Because what happens is when this cap rate gets dropped from 11% to 7.6%, that means the biggest year, the greatest return you can ever have is 7.6%. What's crazy about this is that this was trying to show earlier that conservative rate, they try to pitch you at 6.54%. Now the highest you can ever get on any given year is only 1% higher than that. Now, how does that, how does that impact you in context to the policy right now? How does that impact you in, 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 in context? Like how will this decade, should I say, impact IUL? If we have negative years, what's going to happen is that um, you're, yes, you're protected at zero, but because of the reduction in cap rates, you're never gonna be able to get higher than that. You're never gonna get higher. In this example, you maybe thought when you bought the policy, you could get up to 11%, but now you can only get up to 7.6%, which is abysmal. The bottom line, what I want you to understand is that even if the S&P 500 performs decently, IULs still historically have underdelivered due to those structural limitations. So I think over the next decade, if Goldman Sachs is accurate, we're actually going to see a complete opening up and exposure of IUL, and it's going to lead to a situation that very similar to traditional universal life policies that were sold in the 80s and 90s that fell apart in the early 2000s with tons of policy lapses, tons of lawsuits, and the lawsuits are actually already starting to stack up for IUL as we go here. I've done interviews with uh, one of the top IUL litigation attorneys in the country. We're gonna continue that series. So if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell that way you're notified when those videos come out. All right, so let's get into part four. Interest rate scenarios and their impact on IUL and whole life insurance. Like, as we go forward here, we're obviously in, have been in this low interest rate environment and we're, we're in a situation right now where interest rates have been coming up. Uh, the federal funds rate has come up. Now Jerome Powell has dropped it down a bit, but I think inflation is kind of rearing its ugly head a little bit again. And 
A lot of people have been saying that they don't anticipate getting back down to target inflation rates for some time. A lot of people are worried about stagflation in the 70s. Once again, I'm not saying how it's going to go. I want to be prepared in any situation that comes at us. So let's talk about what the potential uh, scenarios are. Rates are either going to increase, they're going to decrease, or they're going to stay the same, right? It's fair to say those are the three options that we have. So let's start with the potential of rates decreasing. Well, both IUL and whole life insurance in this scenario would see potential returns get reduced due to lower general account performance, right? Because the fixed market drives general fund performance, okay? So what will happen with IUL in that scenario is that it's going to lead to a reduction in your options budget, which is gonna bring down cap rates even more than what I'm showing you here, right? Now, the downside to whole life insurance here is that it has the potential to bring uh, the dividend rates down back towards the 90 year lows that we had in 2022 and 2023. But the bottom line is the main difference here is that whole life insurance has already been near that historic low right now, that, that they're there. IULs on the other hand, uh, are, are gonna be much more negatively impacted because with whole life insurance, we've already been showing what on the illustrations and what the projections are. We've already shown kind of low projections based on all time historic low dividend rates. IUL cap rates are still being sold high. They get hit hard and it's gonna be ugly. Now, if interest rates remain flat at this point in time, the bottom line is IUL is gonna struggle because if they're flat, and, the, and, and Goldman Sachs is right, and we only have a 3% growth per year forecast, and that's what happens, well, then the upside potential of index universal life goes right out the window. Uh, it's akin to just a, a fixed economy and, 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 a, and a traditional universal life policy that's already been proven uh, to be garbage, to, to, to put people and its policyholders into bad situations. On the flip side, whole life dividends would likely outpace this growth rate, right? Providing steadier returns, more stability, uh, and it's ultimately more of a what you see is what you get kind of scenario, whereas IUL illustrations are, are really dangerous and, and not gonna come anywhere close to performing the way that they were sold. Now, what I think is gonna happen is that interest rates are gonna increase. Obviously, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know how this is gonna go. This is just based on where I'm seeing the economy and all the things I'm looking at where I think things are gonna go. Again, I wanna be prepared in any scenario, but let's talk about what happens if interest rates increase. Well, what's gonna happen is IUL cap rates could restrict the real returns despite the market gains. What does that mean? As if, if interest rates go up, that means we're likely in a higher uh, inflationary environment. Typically when inflation is high, um, then the returns in the economy and the market are gonna be high as well. But the problem is if that happens, caps are gonna take off the table your ability to get those big, big returns that are gonna cancel out a lot of the negative years or a lot of the flatter years that we see in these, uh, in these decades that uh, follow the higher valuation periods like that we're in right now. On the flip side, whole life insurance dividends generally track bond rates, right? They trail, they lag, they follow those bond rates, they chase them up. Historically, that's always been what happened. So that would likely increase the dividends in whole life insurance, enhancing policy returns. So one of the reasons that I've been saying for a while now that I think over the next 10 to 15 years, whole life insurance is gonna outperform IUL. All right, so let's talk about inflation. Let's talk about inflation, the historically, how inflation has had an impact on life insurance policies as a whole. Now in the 1930s, uh, following the 1929 crash, inflation was low. While index universal life wasn't even around at that time, whole life insurance paid a dividend every single year, even during the crash years. Whole life insurance policy holders didn't just survive the financial storm, they thrived through that financial storm. The greatest metric we need to ask ourselves is this, compared to what? How did the specific asset compare to other assets during that time frame? The reality is whole life crushed it during the Great Depression. The 1970s, we talked about this a little bit, but high inflation led to higher interest rates and better whole life insurance dividends. IUL still wasn't around at that point in time. UL wasn't invented for an, uh, another decade or so. But while whole life insurance took advantage of those increased dividend rates during that period of time, if you look circumstantially in the environment, it's likely that during that bigger growth rate, 
cap rates would have limited the growth on IUL and constrained that growth. Once again, I'm just projecting there, but when you look historically how everything played out, that's what would have happened. And then of course we got to the 2000s, which was like the opposite, the dot-com era, the opposite of, of, of the stagflation years. Inflation was really moderate, the lowest that we've seen in a long time, and IUL in that environment, now it was the first situation where IUL even existed because it was created in 1997, first situation where it was actually around, and it's the first time I can say that IUL actually underperformed due to market downturns and cap rate constraints. Remember, while IUL was sold on the promise of upside potential and downside protection, protecting you against market loss, this decade saw a constant reduction in cap rates because of the reducing interest rate environment, because of increased volatility, which drove options cost up, because of more people getting into the options market with technology, more people trading options, IUL companies expanding, buying more options, understanding options are a supply and demand product. And so when we had situations where the general fund budget was going down, so the options budget was going down and more competition on the options driving options up, what happened was it doesn't matter what the index was actually doing, IULs actually performed worse than the actual market did. So no matter what everybody's saying to you, that's the reality. All the while, whole life insurance rates weren't pretty either, right? It's one of the reasons uh, whole life insurance gets a bad rap. Whole life insurance constantly dropped from the 80s when they were at their high. Their dividend rates were you know, at the, at the high for some of these companies at 14% dividends, right? They dropped and they dropped and they dropped. They kept going down. A lot of people look at that as a negative thing, but the bottom line is it's not. When you look at it compared to what, whole life insurance outpaced bonds over a 30-year period of time. And it still paid a positive return every single year. Year. So my conclusion is that whole life's dividend structure allows it to better respond to inflationary periods than IUL, especially under high bond yields. The reason for it is because you're going to take advantage of those yields and not give up control of those results. All right, so I said it before, I think whole life insurance is going to outperform IUL over the next decade. Let me give you a couple of reasons why. First and foremost, dividends are going to be resilient in a rising interest rate environment. Higher bond rates lead to increased dividends in whole life insurance, whereas IUL cap rates could suppress the growth and put a cap on the potential growth, taking advantage of higher inflationary periods. The next thing that I love about whole life insurance is that it provides stable performance during a quote unquote lost decade potential, right? Having predictability, something that we can depend on, is more important during volatile times than any other period. When you have that performance there that you can lean on and depend on, having that asset can actually open up opportunity to create wealth in other areas. You cannot understate the importance of having that. And whole life insurance is far and away the most predictable asset that you will ever find. The other reason I would say is that whole life insurance is gonna provide consistent growth through those dividends, right? If it, whether they stay flat or whether they go up, this is gonna give the potential to outperform IUL in low return equity environments. If in fact, Goldman Sachs is right, and we have a 3% annual average return that really restricts IUL's ability to take advantage of upside. Now on the flip side, I love it because it mitigates the downside risk on declining rate scenarios. If interest rates go back down, whole life insurance dividend are already near historical lows. You're already pretty much at the bottom. So, and even if they go a little below where the historical lows are right now, when I say, what's the upside, what's the downside, can I live with the downside, you can look at this, you have the guarantees, the predictability, the stability in whole life insurance, whereas the volatility compared to what you think you're getting with IUL is gonna be far more vast. Now, the final reason that I think whole life insurance is just gonna outperform IUL over the next decade, and, and more importantly than just outperforming, help you outperform your goals over the next decade, is liquidity and cash value. Whole life has guaranteed cash value accumulation that offers predictability, like I said, compared to IUL, which is linked to the market. But what's important about that over the next decade is the surrender charges. Whole life insurance, you don't have to deal with the surrender charges that IUL has that's gonna restrict you and ha you having access to your money over the next decade, which is potentially where you're gonna be able to take it, borrow against it and leverage it in, in other assets outside of the market to go create wealth, right? Things like real estate, businesses, other opportunities that are sure to arise 
just not in equities. On the other side of this, do some research on IUL cap rates. When IUL cap rates get reduced, as I showed you in the illustration earlier, that limits your ability to take advantage of the market returns. Yeah, they may sell you on a 10 or 11% cap rate right now, but what happens when your ability to take advantage of that cap rate gets reduced to 7.6%? What happens when the spread charges, we didn't talk about that a lot. I know a lot of people are selling uncapped indexes right now. Those come with a spread charge. The same policy, if they chose a spread charge, was sold with a 5% spread charge, meaning the first 5% they don't get any credit for. Anything above 5%, it's uncapped, they can get whatever they want. But the bottom line is that spread charge went from 5% to 11%. And so now the market has to do 11% before you get credited at all in your policy. It's insane. These impacts on IUL are really detrimental to your wealth building objectives. At the end of the day, I don't know what's gonna happen in the economy. I don't know what's gonna happen in uh, you know, the, the overall broad equities markets. The people at Goldman Sachs are far smarter than me, but this is what they're calling for. And my area of expertise is life insurance, cash value life insurance, understanding whole life insurance, understanding index universal life insurance, understanding how those two assets and tools can be utilized to help you create wealth. That's what I do. And what I know is that the danger over the next decade, as poorly as, as IUL has performed, over the last decade. And some would say whole life is, has poorly performed as well. But once again, we have to say compared to what? And what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Whole life insurance has performed stellarly compared to the problems that you're trying to solve and the other assets that you'd be comparing it against like a bond. However, IUL, when compared to an investment alternative and you look at the risk, it's, it, it doesn't really do anything better than anybody else. That's the problem. It doesn't provide more stability, more predictability, better tax benefits or anything than whole life insurance. But when you look at it as an investment alternative, it doesn't beat equities. It doesn't beat the markets. It, it, you're just actually injecting in more risk. I think the next decade is gonna expose it. And I think it's going to be accelerated if Goldman Sachs is right. All the while, whole life insurance will still be there, plugging along, being your financial foundation, being able to kind of be a financial fortress that you can build your financial life on and build your whole investment strategy around. It won't be the thing that makes you a lot of money. I call it the BASF. Remember the old uh, BASF? It's like, we don't make the fishing line you buy, we make it stronger. We don't make the paint you uh, buy, we make it brighter. We don't make the products you might buy, we make the products you buy better. Whole life insurance is basically the BASF of the financial world. It's not gonna get you the big sexy returns. It's going to give you the foundation and the financial structure to allow you to create results and make your other investments perform better. That's what it's all about. So hopefully you found value in that. If you did, please like and share this video. Get this out there to people. It's really important. If you have any questions at all, comment in the comment section below. Till next video, have a blessed, inspirational day. We'll talk soon. See ya.